السلام عليكم everyone بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على حبيبه المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا uh, This has been a very interesting week I think this week all of us have been starstruck <laughs> um, because we've been watching these new images that have been coming from this uh, James Webb uh, Space Telescope and it's really been amazing it's been really awe inspiring to see these images for the first time in history it's way beyond what anyone imagined would be able to see it uh, goes far beyond what the hubble telescope was able to to put together um and it's really for me as a muslim it's opened up new possibilities in terms of unlocking some of the meanings within the quran and we're going to see that in the coming weeks we haven't discovered that much. What it's added is more layers. But there might be new possibilities in understanding some of the descriptions of space within the Quran we have yet to see. So I think that's something which is also excited. For those who don't know, <clears throat> this is a $10 billion um, telescope that took over 20 years for NASA to develop. And it's been deployed, um, I don't know the number of miles, but right outside of the earth in the atmosphere. And rather than looking at visible light, what it does is, is it looks at the infrared spectrum of wavelengths and it detects based on heat. If you, I mean, if you want to simplify it, it's, that's why it has to be very, very cold relative to everything else. It has a kind of solar shield that protects it from heat from the sun. And that allows it based on the infrared light, which is a kind of heat, um, or which generates heat um, to detect, um, you know, light, but not visible light. And so in that sense that th this telescope is unlocking uh, a lot of what previously was not detectable. And so we've seen pictures of Jupiter. We've seen pictures of asteroids that are actually been in motion. That's something that the Hubble telescope wasn't able to do. And also the initial photographs were that of deep space. And this is very important uh, because on, on one hand, aesthetically, it's very pleasing, but there's a deeper meaning. So you see like these stars that look like diamonds, right? They're just glittering. And you see that's in the foreground. And then in the background, you see this red and rusty brown colors, gas, dust. And what this represents are the early collisions cosmic collisions that happen in the early first couple of billion of years. It's hard for us to even understand what does that mean when we say 10.3 billion years ago, another image six billion years ago. What it means is that it, it took that many light years for that information to reach us because it's so far away, but by the time it reaches us, in reality, uh, those celestial bodies are even farther away because the universe is constantly in expansion and it's constantly getting bigger. So in reality, what we're seeing are the, the, what we're seeing today are the images of in the time of Big Bang. So these are in the period of the very creation. And we know that scientifically because uh, the information that, that, that is indicated within these images shows <coughs> that it's in the very early period, in the first couple billion years, when the universe was created. And so for Muslims, this is a very strong indication. Everything that we see in the universe is an indication of the creator. Why do I say that? The reason I say that is because there are some who believe that everything that exists always existed. And we find time and time again, whether we look at fossil records, whether we look in our own bodies, whether we look in space, we see the imprint of the creator. Allah says in the Quran, Sanurihim ayatina fil afa. We shall show them our signs in all of the horizons meaning in all levels of space, and within themselves, until it becomes apparent to them that it is indeed the truth. Allah also said that in the Quran that we created space 
wa inna lamusi'un right from wasa wasa means to make wide and to make expanded wa inna lamusi'un but allah uses the ism fa'il here right which is the which is a verbal noun wa inna lamusi'un that we are constantly expanding it so by using that word wa inna lamusi'un it indicates not only that allah expanded it previously but we are constantly expanding it meaning that it has been expanding from the inception from the very beginning and it continues to do so right and this is something that we've witnessed i mean we first wit discovered this with the doppler shift right in the very rudimentary telescopes that they had in the beginning they noticed that uh, you know as you know wavelengths have a certain amplitude there's a certain distance between the tops and the bottoms so what happens is when when you're detecting something that is moving there's a squeezing of the waves together and what are the waves of visible light roy g biv right so the first color in the visible light spectrum is red so when something is moving you have a shift to which color which color is going to get squeezed then you're going to get a red shift and this is the this was the first signal that the universe is expanding is that when they would detect this with telescopes they would notice an increase in and i'm oversimplifying it of course right for us to understand that everything would turn red and they said okay something is happening because the early telescopes could not detect motion the way that this one can so there was a red shift people they call it like a doppler shift right it's similarly when a train is passing have you heard how the sound of the train uh, as it's as it's approaching get the sound gets changed that is because the waves get compressed because something is moving um, and so now the sound waves sound differently right it gets modulated so this is the same kind of shift that happens. And that's confirmed in the Quran. Wa inna la Allah also says in the Quran about the universe expanding about Big Bang that awalam yaro, did they not see anna samawat, that the heavens, wal ard, and the earth itself, kanata, that all of them were ratzqan. Ratzq means something which has been compressed together, that they were all dense matter. Ratzqan means something in which there's no empty space, in which everything has been compressed together. But the way that Allah describes it in a single word is so profound and so beautiful because Ratzq is not something which is like a kind of a mixture. Ratzq is when you have the different elements are all squeezed together, but they're all intact. They're all separate, right? It's not like they're all mixed and they all become one. No, they were all So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this dense matter, even before Big Bang, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knew the, the outcome. That when all of that energy produced this expansion, of the universe and all the galaxies that we're aware of, we're not gonna talk about the multiverse because this is way beyond our imagination. Is there a possibility of another universe? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seems to suggest that is the case. I've spoken about it, Dr. Tariq has mentioned it. Allah talks about Rabbul Alameen. So Alam is the knowable world and he is Rabb of Al Alameen the lord of all of the worlds all of the universes so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying that he's the lord of the universes implies that there's more than one universe because alam comes from the word ilm which is related to the alim the scholar right they are ayats lil alimin allah mentions in surah al rum in the chapter of rome that in it are signs for people who know so is there a possibility that there are universes that are beyond what we're talking about? Absolutely. It is complete possible. But because we don't know about it, we're, we're going to leave it alone. 
we're going to talk about what we know, right? So. فقال لها وللأرض ائتياب it is related to the big bang this is in the aftermath of the big bang that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah dukhan beautiful surah uh, some orientalists have challenged the surah and says that the math doesn't add up because they didn't understand the ayah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about how he created the earth in two days and he furnished everything that's in the earth in four days. So some people have added it together and they said it's six days. But in fact, Allah created the earth and he created everything that's on it within those four days. So the two and the four overlap. So in reality, the total is four days. So Allah in the, talks about in the creation of the earth, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in the creation of the heaven, that wahiya dukhanun, that it was smoke. So what this is talking about is not what precedes the Big Bang, because in the Big Bang was the opposite, was everything was densely compacted. But immediately following the Big Bang, then it produced all of Wahiya Dukhan, and that's why it's called the chapter of smoke. So the smoke that's in Surah Dukhan is not smoke, which is the byproduct of fire, but this is the cosmic dust that was generated, the asteroids and the meteoroids and, and everything, and all this cosmic dust that was produced by all of that energy. Right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them to come Willingly or unwillingly. So then they responded that, no, we come willingly to you, Ya Allah. So that, which indicates that everything which exists in the heavens and the world, even things that, that, that are numbered right now. We're discovering nebula that we never knew existed. You know, solar systems that we never knew existed. They're all being assigned numbers. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who knows every leaf in existence, who knows every drop of water, of course, uh, these galaxies, these solar systems are well within his knowledge. So this ayah fits in, but it fits in after the, as a result of the Big Bang. The main ayah about the Big Bang is the one that we mentioned right now, in which they were ratqan, then Allah says fa. And fa is harf ta'qib, which means it happens immediately, right? I think we have to put the silent, the, the trouble. Um, so fa. Mm -hmm. This is a beautiful verse from Surah Ali Imran. Actually, uh, Qari Anas, he recited it uh, the month before he uh, took his leave um, on, on Jum'ah where in the creation of the heavens and the earth are signs li'ulil albab and I love that expression ulul albab those ones, those who possess a lub and the lub is an analogy to a very strong hardwood tree because a strong and a, you know when you think of redwood trees you know like the ones that we have in the west coast which huge trunks that people can live in, they have a core because every time the tree expands, it makes a new ring and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And what ends up happening is that the central core of that tree is, is, is the most dense and, and, and is the most powerful and is the strongest. That is the lub. And uh, as they say in Arabic, the best of all matters is the middle one. And this is people, they, they attribute this as a hadith. Actually, it's not a hadith. It's a saying that precedes the Prophet wasallam. It's accepted by the religion, but it's not a religious teaching. This was a cultural value that already existed among the Arabs, Right. So they say the ulul al-bab are those people who possess a core, 
those people who reflect. So uh, going back to the Big Bang, everything was ratqan fa. Fa means so, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave the universe in that uh, condensed state for a long period of time, which is exactly, this is why Big Bang Theory and the verses in Quran, I mean, Muslims didn't come up with the Big Bang Theory. This is the truth. Uh, you know, Muslims were not the main developers of this, of this theory, it's true. But it fits so perfectly, so exactly with what's in the Quran, it's kind of irresistible. Because what's in the Quran is that Allah made this dense matter, فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا So, which indicates that there's no delay in time. So everything got compressed, which requires a lot of, a great burst of energy. So in the very creation of the heavens and the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wound it up from the very beginning. So you think of something that's wound up, there's, there is a trajectory and there's energy, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the very beginning put all of that energy in there, that energy is from him. That's the first rule of Newtonian physics, right? That energy cannot be created nor destroyed, right? Of course, we're way beyond Newtonian physics now um, in terms of understanding the universe. This is one thing that the rejectors of Allah have never been able to explain is where did all this energy come from for the Big Bang? Because the expansion is the result of the compression. So then Allah says, فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا which suggests that the Big Bang is the immediate consequence of all of that energy being put in. So Islam supplies the explanation for what happened in a way that the Big Bang leaves open. It's a blank. So then Allah says, what happens? فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا So we separated. فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا means we separated. Which again suggests that they're individual pieces to the universe. Because you, you don't... Separate doesn't mean physically just take it apart. It means to separate where each individual piece goes in the place it's supposed to go. فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا Then Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيٍّ And then we created from water everything which is living. Now, one last verse in terms of Big Bang before we proceed. Allah says, يَوْمَ نَطْوِ السَّمَاءِ That it is a day in which we shall roll up the skies. We shall roll up space. And Allah uses نَطْوِ Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, if you and you look at these images and you think of everything getting rolled, it can be really overwhelming. But what's interesting is the rest of the ayah. Allah says, يَوْمَ نَطْوِ sama That will roll up كَطَيِّ sijil, Like the rolling of scrolls. So you think of these huge pieces of paper that you roll. كَطَيِّ sijil لِلْكُتُبْ كَمَا بَدَأْنَا Just as we began and we initiated all of these skies in the first place. Just as we did in the very first of creation, we shall repeat it again. Why is this very interesting? You know, a hundred years ago, we would have no idea. If you open the tafsirs now, they have a lot of different theories. They focus on the day of judgment. Allah is going to, you know, roll everything up and compress everything. Which is, the, uh, which is the reversal of what he did in the beginning. But nobody answers the question, why is it Why is it like the rolling of a scroll? The reason that it must be like a rolling of a scroll is because when you are compressing matter that has its own gravitational pull, it will not be linear. I hope everybody's following. You're rolling something up, but the thing that you're rolling up has its own force. So it's pulling also. It's not only your force. The thing which you made also has its own gravitational pull. So that means in the Big Bang, when you think of the Big Bang, many of us, we've seen illustrations there wrong. The illustrations show everything separating in a very linear way. That's not how Big Bang happened. 
If you put these two verses together, it means that Big Bang has a twisting action in which something is being opened up like the unrolling of a scroll. And this is a very higher level thought because it, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a clue that the Big Bang can't just be linear because as things are expanding, there's the energy that's, that was already in that dense matter, which is causing the expansion in the first place. Actually, it's continuing. To, the expansion in the universe today is still the result of that initial application of force. But also, all of those bodies, all of those galaxies come with their own gravitational pull. And so when Allah expanded the universe, there was also a countervailing force back in. So it's not, you're not pulling things which are static. Those objects are pulling back in. So you have to kind of twist it in order to overcome the gravitational pull of these objects. So glory be to Allah, the best of all creators. And the reason I'm mentioning all of this as a, as a prelude to what we mentioned in Surah Al-Rahman is that each and every way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the universe and created us is a sign. And not only that, he has programmed the universe in such a way to provide benefits for us. You know, somebody might say, well, you know, why didn't Allah just create us from the very beginning? Why did he need to create all of these creatures, you know, in the Jurassic period and dinosaurs? And, and what about all these amoebas for billions of years? For, not billions of years, for millions of years. And then maybe 100 years ago, 200 years ago, we wouldn't understand. But now we under, we're benefiting from fossil fuels. Can you imagine the industrial revolution without petroleum fuels? It would be impossible to happen. What if we didn't have that rudimentary coal in the very beginning? So there are certain, there's certain wisdom that we're unlocking as time passes. And then we go back and we say, Which of Allah's favor shall you now deny? So going back to the, to the telescope again, what we're looking at is the light that was emitted 13.1 billion years ago. And we always knew that it was a demonstration of Allah's power. But when we see these images that, that, that are so striking in their appearance and in their beauty, these, these stars, these nebula, these, this cosmic dust, everything all together in the foreground and the background, it is also a demonstration of the beauty and majesty in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, you know, creation, right? So all of these are signs for us to reflect on. A couple of other lessons in Surah Ar-Rahman. Uh, one important one is that everything in the heavens and the earth, right? Yes'aluhu man fis-samawati wal-ard. They all beg of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll talk a little bit about that. He is engaged every day with some affair. So this is important as a matter of aqidah, as a matter of belief, that we believe we are not deist. We believe in an active creator. We are not agnostic in the sense that, yes, there is some spiritual power. There's a God that made everything, but then he kind of disappeared. You know, he's, on, he's gone fishing. You know, he's on vacation. We believe in an active creator, a Rabb, a Lord. And Surah Ar-Rahman indicates a lot of the signs that are listed show how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is intervening in our daily affairs and how he is very much present. Another thing is, this also begs another question, especially because Surah Ar-Rahman begins immediately after Surah Al-Qama. And there's a close relationship because Surah Ar-Rahman comes immediately after the verse, Inna kulla shay'in khalaqanahu biqada. Which uh, for the Arabs, it, it's like uh, the Um Kultum song, right? <laughs> she stole some Islamic concepts. Actually, she, uh, Um Kultum is the most famous uh, singer in the Arab world from Egypt. Um, 
and uh, she actually uh, she studied in the Kutab. She she memorized Quran when she was young. A lot of people don't know that, and uh, that's actually where she developed her voice. And um, she sang a lot of beautiful songs in praise of the Prophet sallallahu But she has a very famous song that everything in life and love and destiny is all written in destiny, right? So I think most likely that was taken from the verse in Surah Al-Qamah. That, inna kulla shay'in khalaqanahu bi qada. Allah has created everything predestined, right? With qada. So how does that, how do we reconcile Allah's involvement in, on every day and then also we believe in predestiny in Qadr so how do these two coexist we'll talk about this uh, shortly inshallah nothing exists outside of his knowledge and then in ayah number 33 Allah says ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins that O oh, assembly of mankind and jinn actually I reversed it it says al-jinn al-ins we'll mention this is the only verse in the Quran where Allah addresses jinn first. It's the only one. So why is that? If you're able to penetrate aqtar, the regions of the heavens and the earth, fanfudu, then penetrate them. La tanfuduna illa bi sultan. You'll never be able to do so except with authority. There's so much scientific uh, you know, tidbits in here that it's for scientists it would be very exciting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses aqtar, right? Aqtar means, is, is the modern word for spheres, for diameters, right? Which so by, by saying aqtar is, it means regions, it means zones. But Allah used a word which is typically used for things which are spherical in nature. Which is interesting because Allah also said in Quran, that He is the one that turns, that transforms from day into night and night into day. Allah talks about how all the celestial bodies, they are swimming within their orbit. Right? They have a fixed orbit which indicates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the wisdom of his creation, he has made everything spherical. Everything is rounded and he uses the word aqtar in talking about regions. Then Allah says, la tanfudu, fanfudu. Nafada means to go with speed. Can anyone, has anybody gone to port? Hmm? Yes. Has anyone seen, you know, uh, in, in Cape Canaveral? In Florida, have you seen any of these? Some people, they go there just to watch, you know. Um, and, and it's open to the public. Anyone can go and, and see the, 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 you know, people launching into space, going to the International Space Station. Have you seen how many rockets they use just to penetrate this atmosphere? Can you imagine if and the amount of force that would be required, this is just to penetrate the atmosphere that's right here around the earth. Fanfudu, it indicates that in order to penetrate it, you have to go with great speed. La tanfuduna illa bi sultan, then Allah says with sultan, which means with force, with power. So of course, this is before when people looked up in the, in the sky and they saw the stars, they didn't know that there's something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that he created around the earth saqafan mahfuza, a protected ceiling. We had no concept. I mentioned in one khutbah how this could be considered the ozone layer. Can you imagine the ultraviolet light that would enter into this world? How would anyone live? We would, we would all burn up, even if we survived the UV rays and all of the heat that would be generated, we would all die of cancer. Surely we would all die of cancer because of that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the atmosphere as a saqfan mahfuza, as a protective laying around us. So Sultan shows that there has to be a lot of force and power in order to penetrate it. This is another key ayat when you're talking about the science within the Quran. But there's another lesson outside of the tafsir that we have to ask ourselves. Allah is talking about 
penetrating space. And we are all, everything we've talked about is only a sama ad dunya. Everything we're talking about today is only the first of the seven heavens. These are not the heavens that are in Al Jannah, by the way. When Allah talks about as samawat, as saba, we're talking, these are seven physical heavens, right? So Allah created seven heavens. Everything we're talking about is within the first heaven. Who was able to penetrate all of this? Who was the person who had that sultan? Who was that? Only one being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, other than the angels, has been a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the one who in a single night, Aisha radiallahu anha said the bed was still warm. In those few moments, in those seconds, or however you want to quantify, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was able to penetrate all of the layers, all seven layers, and reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assembly and his company. Why? Because he has sultan. Because he has the power and authority to do so. And this is also interesting, by the way, this ayah, people, you know, some people are really into numerology within the Quran. I'm not a big fan of that. I, I, I know Dr. Tariq is, is like me. He's not a big fan of it either. But I don't want to do you a disservice, so I will mention it. That this ayah, it starts, سَنَفْرُغُ لَكُمْ أَيُّهَا الثَّقَلَانِ is ayah number 31. And Fabi Ayya Ala Rabbi Kuma to Kadiban is mentioned 31 times. So this number from Surah Rahman 31, there's a, there's a lot of connections with the number 31, which we aren't gonna go to. But this is they, the people who are fixated with numbers, they say this is the key question. Because it indicates that Fabi Ayya Ala Rabbi Kuma of your Lord, it indicates that Allah is talking about jinn and ins and human beings. This is the core question. That, um, that which of the favors are you now going to deny? right? Because these are the favors that are within the earth. So if you deny the favors within the earth, then go out into the heavens. If you're able to do so, then deny it over there. So a, a side note, that these seven samawat are not the seven jannas. Right? These are seven physical places, and the entire galaxy, everything that we know is contained within a sama number one. And beyond this, there are six more, but we don't know anything about these six samawat, other than the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created them and he's described for them, like in Surah Al-Dukhan, for example. Jannah, of course, is in the very end. It's in, in the highest one, in Surah Fusilat. Yes, and Jannah is, in the, is uh, on the highest one in the level number one. So this takes us to some of the verses. Uh, we're only going to tackle a few because there's so much that's in here. So as we mentioned the last time, كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ Whatsoever is on the earth will perish. وَيَبَقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ And the face of your Lord, ذُو الْجَلَالِ, possessor, of majesty and all honor will remain forever. Whosoever is in the heavens and the earth, beg of him. Every day he is engaged in some affair. Then which of the blessings of your Lord will you both deny? So this is interesting. If you connect this with Surah Az-Zuma, it indicates that all of the residents of the earth will perish and die. And also all of the re residents of the heavens will all die. Illa man sha Allah. Except for those whom Allah wills. So Imam al-Sha'abi, he said that when you've recited, whosoever will perish, don't stop. As we mentioned last time, continue. Kullu man alayha wa So he said, this is a matter of reciting. This is why the person who is the reciter of the Quran has to understand the Qur'an. You need to be faqih in order to understand the Qur'an because actually Ali karam Allahu wajha, he said that half of the knowledge of the Qur'an is in the knowledge of al-wuquf wal ibtida, in knowing where to stop and where to begin. And I can tell the imam whether he understands depending on where he stops and where he begins. 
because sometimes people stop in weird places and then you realize that they really didn't understand the ayah. You can figure it out based on where they stop. So Imam Sha'abi, he said, you should continue. Why? Because you should continue that the face of your Lord will remain forever, right? Because it's a kind of istithna, it's a kind of exception. Mm -hmm. The marks are there to help us. But this is a higher level. This mark is not there. Because it will say that Kullu man fan, you'll see jim, which means jawaz al wusul. That means it's allowed to stop and it's allowed to continue. So you see the jim means jawaz. It means it's, it's acceptable. It is permissible. This is a higher level. When, so for example, you'll see in the Quran, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُ خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ So you'll see, there you'll see a jim. Do not follow the steps of shaitan. We never heard any of our teachers stop in that ayah. I never saw that. Why? Why did we never stop on the word of shaitan? The meaning is sound. Don't follow the steps of shaitan. This requires a higher level of knowledge. Why did none of our teachers, they never stopped on the word shaitan? Because they didn't want to give him the respect and the dignity and the honor of ending the sentence with his name. That's why you see uh, Imam Anas, you see myself sometimes, we, when we're reciting, we say, What that's the whole ayah we stop. What the What the Kullaha in Allah Khabirum Bimatarmanun. Because the recitation is a way of honoring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we say, What the Kullah? Just with two words, three words. Have taqwa, have piety of Allah. So that's why we never saw our teacher stop on the word shaitan. There is no rule for it. It's the same way uh, people argue and debate. And I saw in every, I didn't see it in ICCP, but I see it in every masjid. People, they start debating, can we put the Quran on the floor? I don't know if you've heard people say that. Or sometimes people get upset. They say, don't face your feet towards the Qibla. There is no hadith on either topic. Why? Because the Sahaba, they never put their foot towards the Qibla. They had enough sense. So there's no hadith about putting your feet towards the Qibla. If somebody puts their feet towards the Qibla, is there anything wrong? No. They didn't do it. You don't have to interrupt and say, oh, brother, you're doing something wrong. No, because there's no rule against it. There's no rule against putting the Quran on the floor. It's allowed as a matter of fiqh. But as a matter of adab, absolutely not. As a matter of adab. So you can correct somebody's adab with bad adab. If you're going to correct somebody, you have to do it in a beautiful way. You can't, you can't use bad etiquette in order to correct somebody's adab. And sometimes we see that happen. So what they would do is say, And what will the enemy? He is a clear and manifest enemy unto you. Right, so even the recitation, it's designed, it's it's it starts, it, it ends in a way to bring you closer to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, exalted and majestic is He. So the wajh, the countenance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, is an attribute of Allah. So there's a matter of philosophy here and, and theology. So the people, they asked the question, they said, is it a necessity, is it an intellectual necessity that Allah has a wajah, that Allah has a face, that he has a countenance? It is not necessary that Allah has a wajah, but it is rationally possible. So the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a face and Allah, laysa kamitslihi shay, there's nothing like him, the two are not in contradiction. But we know that Allah has a wajh because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us through the revelation unequivocally. And it's 
it's different from some of the other verses because in some of the other verses, like I mentioned, Yadullah doesn't mean Yadullah. This is my view. You don't have to agree with it. I believe that Yadullah means Allah's power. But there are other Muslims that say Allah indeed has a hand. Bila kayf, without describing what his hand is like. So I, I'm following the view that Allah doesn't have a hand, right? But wajhullah, the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been described in literal terms. And so it's rationally possible. So the question is, this countenance is not a separate existence. When we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is al-hay, Allah exists. Allah exists. This is the, the most important attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allah is. Allah exists. So the wajah cannot exist on its own. That means that this wajah has to exist within his being. It has to abide forever. So of course we only know about the wajah from the traditional text, from the Quran, from the sunnah, right? But this wajah is part of Allah's that. It is part of Allah's essence. It is part of Allah's being. So everything will perish except for his face. So now with that aqidah, now with that philosophical point, when you read the ayah, it makes more sense. So when we're saying except for his face, it's not the face which is, which is remaining. What is it that's remaining? It is Allah himself, his that Allah as he is, which is eternal. Allahus samad. He is the one who is eternal and forever there. Yes. Yeah. Right. So there are many verses in the Quran. Be aiding. Then he says, "Be and then the Yadullahi fauqa aidihim surafat." There are a lot of verses. But what I have found, and this is not my own idea, these are from the scholars, there's a difference of opinion about the hand of Allah, right? But what I have observed is every verse about the hand of Allah is used metaphorically, and it has to do with power and creation. So the hand of Allah, and it is acceptable to believe, for someone believes that Allah has a hand, bila kayf, but you cannot describe it, then this is acceptable. But I'm not convinced. So then does that mean that Allah has a left hand? No. Does Allah, Allah only talks about, and then in Allah verses, bi'aydin, we did it with hands. So does it mean that Allah has hands? Because in the Arabic, you have, you have one, you have dual, and you have plural. So there's a lot of problems. If we, if we take this ayah literally, okay. So in the view that I'm taking, it doesn't mean right literally, physical, because also space, what does that mean, right and left? In space, in Allah's existence, there's no right and there's no left. He is the one who has created the physical dimensions and the right and the left. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the right, that means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, it's, he's talking about his creative power. And that he's doing it with his right hand, which means that he has imbued beauty and nobility and honor in that which he has created. And the most honorific thing that he has created is the ruh, which is the soul. Right? And so that's why in some cases when he's talking about the universe, it's just he created with his hand. And then in, I think, only one case, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the right hand. And that's because... That indicates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is creating, but he's creating something which is especially beautiful and something which is especially honored. But there are others who disagree. So I want to just be fair. I don't want to tell you only what I think. There are others who say, no, it means that Allah has a right hand. But I find this very problematic because if Allah has a right hand, we're human beings. If somebody says, oh, I didn't use my right hand, we'll understand that means they use their left hand. But if you say Allah has a hand, does it mean Allah only has one hand? Does he have two hands? What about the verse saying that Allah created with hands? In Arabic, you have a, a plural word. It means three or more. 
So I'm not convinced of, of, of this argument. There are other verses. Allah says that Kullu shay'in halikun illa wajha. Everything shall perish except for his face. He says in Surah Al-Kahf, we already did this tafsir, that wasbir nafsaka and keep yourself patiently with those who call on their Lord morning and afternoon seeking his face. In Surah Al-Ma'arij, those are the people who give in charity and give food. What do they say? Innama, we feed only liwajhillah. For seeking Allah's face only, meaning seeking Allah's pleasure. So in these verses, wajhullah represents the honor and dignity and respect and love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It indicates that Allah doesn't deteriorate in any way. Everything else will reduce and deteriorate. So every single thing, we notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created within humanity a process in which trees grow, they become stronger, then they become weaker. The human being, again, they balagha ashuddahu, they reach their position of strength, then they, they reach 40, right? Which in the Islamic lexicon, 40 doesn't mean 40 exactly, but it means there's an age in which you, you receive intellectual maturity, an age of wisdom, and then you raddu ila arda lil umar. Then Allah returns you back to a position of weakness. And that it means physically, and it also means intellectually. Some people, they suffer memory loss and other cognitive deficits as they go through the aging process, right? After min da'afin, quwa, and then they go from weakness to strength, and then from strength into weakness. The only one who does not experience this process of deterioration is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything else gets reduced. This is a consolation for the believer because it shows that whatever affliction you have, whatever problem you have, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is eternal. His power is a constant. And all of the problems which you are facing are eventually going to come to an end. Everything ends except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is free. He is ghani. He has free from all wants. And everyone is in need of him in all situations and conditions. So some people, Mujahid, he quotes from Ubaid, he said that of the affairs of Allah, and it's based on a weak hadith, but the meaning is sound, is that Allah answers the supplicant. He gives to the person who's requesting. He removes an adversary. He cures the person who's sick or seeking to be cured. So this is a refutation of the belief that Allah took a Sabbath, that Allah took a rest. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَا مَسَّنَا مِن لُغُوبِ in Surah Qaf, that we did not experience any tiredness because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing could exhaust him. In any given moment, he forgives sins, he covers faults, he removes difficulties, he purifies hearts, he distances one slaves, he lowers another, he raises another person, he shows someone generosity. All of this happens simultaneously, which is beyond our observation. So, of course, we understand that the people in the heavens, they ask Allah for forgiveness. The people on the earth, they ask him for sustenance. They ask him for forgiveness or they ask for both. Everyone is in need of him. But this ayah, and I think we'll conclude on this point, and we'll pick up the points about the atmosphere next time, because we also have to talk about kanat, wardat, and kaddihan, about the red rose nebula. So we'll continue that next time, but we'll... Uh, end on the philosophical note, right? There's a huge debate about what of the people who don't ask. Allah says, Kullu yas'aluhu man fi samawato, that everybody's asking. So one is that those who don't ask are too insignificant. They don't even matter. This is one view. Another one say, some people call on him despite their kufr, despite their disbelief. What does that mean? It means that they're calling on Allah, not with their tongues, but due to their fitrah. Although that's the second one. Some people in the state of, of dependency, you know, even though they, they disbelieve that when they're really in, in trouble, they say, oh God, help me. Oh God, if you're out there. But then there are others who say it with lisan al-hal. 
Lisan al-hal, not lisan al-maqal. So lisan al-maqal is the tongue, your physical tongue that we use for speech. But there's lisan al-hal, which is the tongue of your condition. Meaning that when the human being, we have our inherent weakness. So even if our tongues are not asking, our situation itself is begging for assistance. So when the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really in need of Allah, their situation itself is speaking to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. So this is another way. I find this a very appealing explanation. There's a third one, which is what about the people who are so busy with worship that they don't ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There's a hadith about that. That if bus being busy with my remembrance is hadith Qudsi, prevents someone from asking, I will give him better than those who ask are given. So Allah promises that the one who's so busy in dhikrullah that they don't even have time, oh Allah, give me a million dollars. Oh Allah, give me a good family. Allah will give them regardless. Better than those who are asking because that person is so occupied in ibadah. And so not everybody's asking. And as the poet said, between lovers, there is a secret that pens and words of creation are incapable of conveying. Meaning that some people, they have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So their supplications are not with words. There's a different kind of communication that takes place within that. Inshallah, next time that we meet, we'll pick up, we'll talk about Qadr. And we'll talk also about, we gave some of the takeaway lessons about space and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging the human being and jinn to penetrate all of the levels of space if we're able to do so. But I really uh, enjoyed the fact that today's discussion comes on the heels of these telescope uh, images because what it demonstrates is the limits of our knowledge, right? We're, what is it that we're viewing? Reflect on that. Yes, it's beautiful, but we're viewing galaxies that look different today than at the time that the light on these images are representing. Some galaxies that no longer exist, stars that don't exist. We have no hope of ever reaching any of these nebula that we're looking at. And yet we know it exists. So the fact that there's something out there and still 10.3 billion years we still haven't reached the limits in terms of knowledge of what Allah has created. Forget about reaching physically the limits of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. So which of Allah's favors shall you now deny? Inshallah, let's see if there's any uh, discussion points or, or questions. We can take them up, yes. Uh, 